Hey, welcome back to RSA 2024. Come on inside theCUBE, we're here at Broadcast Alley. These are my favorite segments with some of my favorite people. The CUBE Collective, folks coming in, bringing in the independent perspectives, Howie Shu, who is the, the, the host of Byte Into Future, a new program that he's starting. Of course, friend of the CUBE. Uh, great to see you, Stanford lecturer, formerly Palo Alto, formerly Zscaler, AI, you know, visionary, great to see you. Sarbjeet Johal, founder, CEO, principal, analyst at Stack Payne, also a member of the Cube Collective. Guys, thanks so much for make, making some time at, uh, at RSA. Okay, first question, is NVIDIA, <laughs> I'm laughing, is NVIDIA Cisco or Google? More towards Google, a little bit of Cisco, more of Google, which I actually hand painted that, that graphic. The slider. And yes, and then, and then tweeted that, right? So yeah. that's all I think. We, had, I, we did a funny little, I don't know if you saw it. My, my, what do you think? Uh, Cisco, if, if most likely. However, if Jensen Huang is going to be healthy, running the company for the next 15 years, they have a chance to be the Google. Because, okay, so it's a founder-led. So it makes a huge difference. So if this all happened 10, 15 years ago, you would be leaning more toward Google. Yes. Very interesting, that's a new perspective we hadn't heard. Crawford Del Pret, uh, CEO of IDC, he's actually president, but he's, right. they just give him the IDC. title. IDC, he's crying out loud. president, he's, IDC. He's president, but they should make him CEO, don't you think? Yes. Anyway, he func functionally is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he weighed in and said that uh, it's really like the Wintel duopoly, that that was, in his opinion, the best example. I said, what about Apple? He said, no, Apple's a closed system. You know, Wintel was a, a de facto open. I, what do you think about I, that? I think there's no direct analogy, to be honest with you. You know why? Of course, Because yeah. there's a new paradigm in computing. Like, it, it's, a, it's a shift. I, I, yesterday I was thinking hard about that, sort of those analogies, and then I thought like, okay, we have this binary computing, zeros and ones, right? And we have, on the other side, we are waiting for quantum to happen. This thing is somewhere in between. You throw a computer, like, you know, zero, more zeros and ones, like frantic dance of zeros and ones. Uh, that's what it is, right? So uh, you are unleashing the compute on top of data, and then you're trying to find the sort of probability, uh, you want to unleash the probability math on, on that data, and then get the results back. So it's a new paradigm uh, shift, I think. It, 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 you can't compare it to the existing stuff. Um, I think it's comparable. <laughs> uh, no. So in the 90s, right, we overviewed the internet, right? You know, Cisco bought all those optical stuff, and then not just Cisco, right, UUNet. You know, by the time of the dot-com crash, we, the internet, the backbone utilization was very, very low. Um, and I think uh, because, you know, at the time, you know, towards the end of the 90s, we thought, okay, not enough. Within two years, we thought, okay, we overbuilt it. I think this is exactly happening, right? Last two years, we couldn't buy enough of the H100, A100. Now, you know, with the H200, with the next generation, I think in two years, we are, we are going to see we have GPU glut. Now, the GPU glut, not because, not because, you know, we cannot find an application to consume that, there will be other bottlenecks, right? Space, cooling, energy. Power, so yeah. once we see that being the bottleneck, we will have see, you know, we, we will see that we overbuilt uh, GPU capacity. I mean, the interesting take, if, if we don't have a glut in GPUs, this will be like the first time in the history of semiconductors that we didn't have cyclicality, right? So uh, one would expect that would be the we case. Will, we will see yeah, that. I think history always repeats. Yeah, it's very hard to predict exactly when. So, uh, but, but you're right, uh, the past is not prologue, but it kind of, there's a pattern there. I want to qualify my statement. I want to defend against you <laughs> your yeah, objection. Good, and that is, that is like, I'm saying that that form of computing will be prevalent, but NVIDIA, what role NVIDIA plays and if what competitors come in and then they take the, the fair share, that is still remains, remains to be seen, I think, yeah. But as you said, if NVIDIA focuses on the software and the, the, and the software stack, they, they will do much better. So I think, let's, let's, let's take really simplistic, training and inference. Yeah. I mean, in training, I feel like NVIDIA's got a moat that they'll be able to protect for a while. For a while. I, I just don't see Intel or AMD 
you know, really attacking that. Um, they've got, they, so they, uh, they, I think, will enjoy a large market share. It'll, it'll go down from 100%, but still. Um, inference is interesting. You know, Apple's going to get into the, to the space. Uh, one other thing, the hyperscalers. They're all going to have their you know, alternatives to yes. run cheap. And a plus, a different workloads. architecture may actually you know, do the inferencing better, faster. Like you, know, you see Grok, right? You know, it's a different architecture. So this is what I want to get to, Howie. You know, word is NVIDIA is working on a new inference architecture. No reason they can't. They were early on in ARM, right? So they got some experience there. They're actually really good chip designers. Do you think it's, do you think they have the mentality to do inference? Is it, is, or is it their DNA and, like you heard Jensen at GTC, we need bigger chips, we need bigger GPUs. What do you think? Look, you know, inferencing, you know, I, I give the example of Grok, right? You know, who knows? Grok may be a better architecture for lower latency, you know, faster turnaround of the, uh, all the chat GPT stuff. Yeah. I think the jury's still out there, uh, but I think other guys have a chance, at least, yes. to your point. I think the training for the next few years, um, you know, they pretty much, not just the better at a hardware, software, they pretty much, you know, got the whole ecosystem locked in, right? You know, I don't know how much you have heard about this HBM stuff, right, you know. Oh yeah, you know, high, bandwidth I mean, high bandwidth memory. memory is like they, a big they literally got the entire ecosystem, right? The, the supply and the demand stuff, all, you know, locked in. So even if um, AMD or the rest of guys are able to do better technology, it's a little bit too late. Mm. But for the inferencing, you know, I think uh, yes, I think I, I, I see the potential. All right, let's talk about RSA, since we're at RSA. Yes. Uh, trip report, you know, what, what, have, what have you seen? Um, have, you, have you been over to the, uh, the show floor? Yeah, I made a quick round, like two and a half hours. Packed, right? I mean, <laughs> it's, it's packed, yeah, it, it's condensed, it's packed, and, and lots of new startups. Uh, as you did the analysis, you know, um, your analysis uh, a couple of weeks back, like how the, the vendor, you know, busyness is there, right? So it, it, it's crazy out there. But at the same time, the acquisitions are happening, right? So I saw uh, Broadcom, uh, Carbon Black, you know, small logo there, big Broadcom, and then Cisco has Splunk, and all these big guys are gulping anything which is decent in business-wise, right? They are buying the market share. So they're sort of solidifying their market share. That's what I, I see. I thought, I, I had predicted VMware was going to delever carbon, carbon black. black yeah. And I, I don't know what happened. We talked about it on the pod. I don't know if they didn't but get they their didn't price, um, or they feel like they can maybe make some investments and get a better price. Um, that, that surprised me, because they got to delever. I mean, Octane said we will delever, and they have been doing it. So. Yeah, they have semantic on one side and carbon black on the other. Yeah. And, and there's no mention of VMware. I was sad to see that, because I'm ex VMware. I was like, where's VMware logo? So yeah, you like, guys are both ex VMware. Yes. Right? yes. You know, what are you do? <laughs> yes. Yeah. I feel, we've done so many VMware <laughs> explorers and VMworlds, I feel like, you know, we're ex VMware. We're still VMware, though, so yeah, hopefully yeah. we'll be there this year. So, what about the show for you? What have you what have you seen? Any takeaways? It's more or less the same, right? Lots of the vendors. It's hard to differentiate among them. Uh, it's funny that I brought in a friend who's not in the cybersecurity industry. He just said, "Hey, you know, I saw so much news. Can you bring me to the uh, expo?" I said, "Sure." You know, um, he got into the show for two hours, and I came out. And he said, "They all look the same. You know, <laughs> <laughs> they all say the same thing." <laughs> so you know, sure. so I think uh, this is uh, this is that. I think one of the interesting thing is how people are leveraging. I mean, clearly, RC is the biggest conference for you know cybersecurity, right? right? But how people are leveraging this conference is, uh, there is a lot of innovation. You know, I just told you, right, you know, uh, a lot of companies, they may not have as big a presence, you know, like Palato Network uh, in the show, but, you know, actually outside the show, uh, around the show, right, doing a lot of the things to, to maximize um, the, the return on investment. So RC is still the center of the universe in terms of the, you know, because customer come here every year, you know, but how do you, get the most out of it. There is a lot of innovation out of it. Yeah, so I think the, the part of the challenge here, as you guys well know, we, we all talk about you know, just so many tools, so many different things, but you look at this survey that we did 
Look at the they got priorities. Everything's a priority. You yeah. know, what are your top priorities? Well, we got we got ten, and there's probably a, another list of fifteen that they could they could mention. So this is why CISOs don't sleep at night. They got fifteen priorities, so they have none. Um, do you ever see that changing? I think a lot of that is just uh, the mentality, the culture of the CISO, right? You know, the best of breed is still um, pretty much, you know, uh, most of them have, right? Now, of course, you know, Palado Network and then, you know, maybe some other companies started talking about platform strategy, but if you ask a CISO today, if you do a poll, you know, today, still majority of them are kind of a best of breed camp. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I mean, like, think about this, like, wh what, don't you need to protect everything? You need to protect everything. You end device, end user device. You know the users mentality. The users need training, the password, password hygiene. You know all, every touch point needs to be protected. It, you know your system is as secure as the weakest link is. You know so that that's why it, that sprawl is increasing. You know like the 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 target hack happened through the HVAC. You know like. They were fixing their AC, and they they will go through that system to go into their network and store all that data, right? So yeah. it, you have to be cohesive, and and there's no shortage of connected things going forward. Yeah. More and more critical infrastructure. I mean, we've, we've yeah. had a lot of conversations this week about critical infrastructure yeah. and how vulnerable it is. Um, uh, yeah. To be clear, there is a value for platform. Right, you know, because you want all the data yeah. to be connected, so that not too many silos. The fact you have 50, 100 solutions, that itself is a problem. So I, you know, I think Nikesh from Palado now has been talking about platformization. I think there is a lot of the good intent, and I think uh, that there's a value in that. Um, but whether you know the industry is moving fast enough towards that direction, I think we will see in the next, uh, you know, six to 12 months. Yeah, talking about the infrastructure, I. I was, uh, stopped by the FBI's booth, right? And Homeland Security is next to them as well over there. So they have a project called InfraGuard where they have um, sort of created a, a consortium of private companies working with the FBI. The FBI leads that, you know, uh, sort of initi initiative, InfraGuard, to protect the critical infrastructure of uh, US. So they are grappling, go government entities are, or the, you know, yeah, those institutions are grappling the same way what private companies are grappling with the security stack. This is a new beast though, you, you know, the whole IT, OT, schism, and the cultures of engineering versus sort of IT, you know, ops, uh, you know, the connected infrastructure. Now you got AI coming in on top. Um, yeah. so, so the other part of that question is, smells like opportunity to me, Howie. <laughs> you know, it's like, a lot of money to be made securing that critical infrastructure. How big do you think that market is? This would be a great David Floyer question. Like if you had the TAM eyes, you know, you got the existing cybersecurity market. Let's call it, let's call it 150 billion. Uh, Close to 200 billion. Let's now. call it 200 billion then. And a half is, you know, service and a half is product, roughly yeah. speaking. Yeah, okay. So that's about right for any market, you know, service dominates. And then, is the is securing critical infrastructure? I know it's part of that 200 billion, but is the opportunity the TAM? I mean, how much bigger is it? Is it is it double? Is it 10 percent bigger? Is it triple? I mean, how should we think about that? Well, anytime we have a new, you know, a new technology, new platform, new vector, you need a new budget, a new technology, new solution, right? Uh, I don't know. It's going to AI is going to double the um, security budget or security spend for the next few years, but it's going to be increasing. But the other thing is, you know, you and I discussed, uh, you know, we looked at some uh, research, right? I think at this moment, people are still learning, right? Uh, we did a poll of, you know, hundreds of people, roughly 62% of people come to RSA to learn, you yeah. know, what's the implication. They're not ready to pull the trigger to buy anything yet. Um, the budget or the spend implication may happen six months from now or 12 months from now or maybe even longer, but I think it's going to happen. But not, like right now, right, people are still learning and watching. Yeah, I mean, you, you say you come to the show a lot, so you're sort of jaded, but 
the one difference that I've noticed between this year and last year's, last year was a lot of talk about Gen AI. It was more Gen AI, the tackers using Gen AI, and write better emails, um, uh, using Gen AI to orchestrate, you know, things like, we, we hadn't seen Charlotte yet, but you know, stuff like CrowdStrike, stuff like that, but they were talking about how you know, it could change the SOC analyst experience. Today, this week, we're hearing much more about well, wow, AI creates new exposures and we need security for AI and that's a different way to think about things. Um, and so, you know, language is going to yeah. be secured differently. And, you know, and if, if you are using voice to enter a system, right, or, yeah. or your face or like, you can create like fake, you know, identities of people like this with Gen AI. So the social engineering part um, of the security sort of hackers, they, they are, it gives them a lot of uh, ammunition to throw out the good guys. And then there's a reason that uh, this year's uh, first place of the Innovation Sandbox is a company that, you know, that's that, that's solution for that, right? You know, Reality Defender. So, you know, for faked image, faked voice, it's going to be a bigger and a bigger problem. So, that, I mean, that will increase TAM. And yeah, I think your question was like, Protecting yeah, yeah. critical infrastructure, yeah, yeah. Well, how, yeah, well, how, how much they will add? Yeah. I, think about, I, I think maybe 30 to 35 percent, I mean easily, because we need to think a lot more about our critical infrastructure now going forward. Um, yep, China is, China is our main adversary and they're attacking us every day. The government's going to do a lot of that spending. It's, it's national right. security. It goes into the national security. Anything goes into that bucket, like there's a sense of urgency and when there's a sense of urgency, money flows there. Yeah. And it's a tough problem to solve, right? You know, for instance, you know, even in, at a um, show this morning, I saw a startup doing things like, hey, any person can ask a question, what is the company's budget, uh, revenue? But not everyone should get the answer, right? You need some access control. But today, large language model is not very good at it, so you need to do certain arts and then things. But the reality is, we don't have, we don't have a sophisticated enough solution for that. Yeah. We can probably get it 80% right, 90% right, but the last 10, 20% is difficult. So, we got to wrap, but so tell me about this bite into future. What is that all about, um, your new program? This is about, you know, the learning new things, right? You know, we have Silicon Valley has so many entrepreneurs. I wanted to talk to the entrepreneurs, some of the senior executive, uh, some of them, you know, learned so much. I wanted to talk to them from technology point of view, from entrepreneurship point of view, so that uh, we, you know, using your word, right, open source the learning so that um, the community can benefit from that. Awesome. And a part of the uh, reason I did this uh, Body Into Future was inspired by the Cube. Yeah. So <laughs> Fantastic. Good, good. Well, we'd love to have more content that's open in the market, so congratulations on getting that off the ground. So, geez, it's music to your ears, obviously, this is what you do. Yeah, that's what I do, actually. Uh, our thinking sort of matches, that's why yeah. I am with you guys all the time, yeah. wherever, wherever you go, I'm there, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I think um, the, the narratives are important, you know? Um, in, in the security sort of space, uh, we are never 100% secure. The minute you leave home, somebody can hit you, car can hit you, you are never 100% secure, so it's more about the risk management. I think if you, if you rename security as risk management, you will spend it differently, you will plan differently. So um, that's, um, that kind of, I think, just, just taking a look at the problem from a different angle, that's very important. I think uh, we can save a lot of money and agony and you know, frustration in, in many different parts of the technology stacks, if we look at the problem from, from economic angle, from practitioner economics angle, versus the vendor economics, we, we talk about that, yeah. right? So yeah, I'm, I'm doing that, so thanks for giving me the platform. Yeah, always, always guys, you And then one last welcome. plug, tomorrow, you know, the Reality Defender founder CEO, the winner of the Sandbox uh, context, would have come to my show. Uh, Biting to Future at right. New York Stock Exchange Live. Phenomenal, nice. I can't wait to, to see that on social. Guys, great conversation as always, you're always welcome here, really appreciate you know, your partnership, John and I really value that, the entire CUBE team does as well, so thank you. Okay, and thank you for watching, keep it right there, we'll be back with Jay Chaudhry, right after this break. <laughs>